Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third episode of the Farm Chatter Shop Tzai's Fee series. On this episode of the series, I spoke with Professor Jakob Dweck, who's a professor at Princeton, and we discussed with Jakob Sasportis, who is the focus of uh, Professor Dweck's newest book entitled Dissonant Rabbi uh, from Princeton University Press. And we in particular discussed Jakob Sasportis and his work, Tzitzis Neville Tzvi, which is about the, the history and the, of the uh, Sabahitian movement. And he was the main opponent uh, during the main period of uh, when Shabbat was, I guess, active in 1665, 1666, well, before that, after that. And he recounts all this in his Tzitzis Neville Tzvi. So we discussed him, his life, and various um, different aspects of that. Um, I would like to once again thank the corporate sponsor of the series, Glock Plumbing, for all your service needs, big or small in New Jersey, with a full service division, from boiler changeouts, main sewer line snakeouts, cameraing main lines to a simple faucet leak. Glock Plumbing Service Division has you covered. Give them a call, 732-523-1836, extension 1. Again, 732-523-1836, extension 1. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments or wants to... Um, Sponsor a show or support the, the show, uh, you can please email me, farmchatter at gmail.com. And in particular, any comments about the Shop Space V series? I've gotten a lot of comments in particular so far already uh, from a lot of listeners. So if anyone has any comments or, or questions, uh, they can let me know. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Farm Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Professor Jakob Dweck, who is a professor professor of history and Judaic studies at Princeton University. And we'll be having a conversation f- focused on his uh, newest book, which is Dissident Rabbi, The Life of Jacob Sosportis. And uh, I guess mainly focused on his work, Tzitzis Neuvel Tzvi, but obviously on more than that as well. So thank you very much, Professor Dweck, for joining me. Thank you for having me, Nafi. So let's start off a little bit. Tell the listeners uh, about a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, I'm a, I teach at Princeton University, where I've been teaching since 2008, uh, and I teach a lecture course on modern Jewish history, where we begin in the 17th century and we end with the Sotmers in um, Kiryas Yoel in the late 20th century. And before I uh, got my job at Princeton University, I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. And before that, I was a graduate student at the University of Cambridge. And before that, I was an undergraduate at Columbia University. Very nice. So, so let's go right into Sasportis. Obviously, you have you have uh, another book as well on 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 the, the I think it's called the Scandal of Kabbalah, right? On Yudari Eliana Modena, but we'll not get into that. So, you know, how, when, and why did you get into Sasportis? And we'll get into him in a minute. But how did you get there? It's an interesting question. Uh, it was a suggestion that someone had that someone had given me many years ago to read to read and to look at Sasportas. And I was too young at the time to understand why it was such an important subject. And after I had finished working on Modena, I wanted to stay in the 17th century. And one of the things that I enjoyed about Modena was that he was an op- he was a figure who was oppositional to a lot of the trends of his time period, but he stayed within the tradition. And Sasportas is also a figure who is oppositional, but he stayed within the tradition. And that was the bridge between Modena and Sasportas. The difference was that Modena is probably the most celebrated early modern Jew who ever lived. We know more about him than we know about it, probably any other Jew who lived in the 17th century, with the possible exception of Glickel of Hamelin. And where, but Sasportas was someone who People knew about him. Sholem had written about him extensively as an opponent of Shabtai Tzvi, but the work hadn't been done in terms of figuring out where he had been, when, and, and, and why, how he had moved around. And so that presented its own kind of challenge to, to write a kind of book about him that involved reconstructing his life and following where he lived rather than simply analyzing just one text. Got it. Okay, so why don't we start off, we'll tell the listeners who are familiar, may, may not be familiar with him, and he lived his life entirely, I mean, almost the entire 17th century. So talk a little bit about him and, and, and his life. So as you mentioned, he, his life spans almost the entirety of the 17th century. He's born, depending on which source you trust, either around 1610 or around 1614. And he's born in Oran, which is modern day Algeria, the city of Wahran. It's important to realize, though, that in the early 17th century, Oran was 
a presidio of the Iberian Empire, of the Spanish Empire, which basically means that it was a frontier town that had a fortress and it had soldiers, and it was an outpost of the Spanish Empire in North Africa. Uh, the town was largely a Christian town, largely Catholic town, and there were some Jews. Sasportas' family had fled Aragon in 1391 after the riots, and they had been living in North Africa for roughly two and a half centuries, from the late um, 39, from, from 1391 roughly until the, the early 17th century. The, 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 there were two ruling families of the Jews of Oran, the Sasportas family and the Cancino family. And the rabbi, Jacob Sasportas, the one who I wrote about, was one of several Jacob Sasportases who lived in the 17th century. He had a very thorough rabbinic education. This we know because he was serving on a bed dean when he was in his late teens, and he was um, the head of the bed dean when he was in his 20s. He moves from Oran further south to a town called Plemsen. Um, and then at a certain point in the, the late 1640s, he's forced to flee North Africa. And we don't know why. Um, there are two conflicting accounts, and both of these conflicting accounts are published half a century after the fact. So they can be used, but they, they have to be used with, with a lot of caution. He flees Oran, and he, or he flees Oran and Tlemcen, or he flees North Africa, and he ends up in Amsterdam. And it's only after... A, uh, a, a, a period of time that he's able to get his family redeemed from captivity um, and joining him in Amsterdam. And he, then he stays in, in, in Amsterdam for the better part of a decade. Um, and he comes into a very different situation than he's in in North Africa. In Amsterdam, there are many, many Talmidei Chachamim. There, are, there is a surfeit of talent and he's not needed. So he looks around for a job and he finds a job in a printing house where he works with Menashe ben Israel. He's the typesetter for a, Menashe ben Israel's uh, most important Hebrew book called Nishmat Chaim. And he also writes some responsa, but he can't really find a job. In the late 1650s, he goes back to North Africa, unlike a lot of the other rabbinic figures who, who leave North Africa and enter Europe in the early modern period and never, never to return to North Africa. He actually returns to North Africa. But this time he returns to the Atlantic coast, to Saleh. And Saleh in the 17th century is its own republic. And Sasportas is in Saleh for um, a number of years, where again, he works as a posek. Um, and he is probably there as the factor for one of the Portuguese families in Amsterdam um, who are doing business with North Africa. The Dutch are trading guns with the Republic of Saleh, and the Jews are uh, very important go-betweens in this, in this trade. He then flees Saleh for a famine, and goes back to Amsterdam for a very short time, and then is in London, where he is the first rabbi of the newly reestablished um, Portuguese um, Jewish community. And he gets into a, a number of um, bitter disputes with the, um, with the Portuguese Jews in London. But then he flees London again, not because of famine and not because of violence, but because of the plague. Um, around 9,000 people per week are dying in London in the summer of 1665, and he flees. He flees um, to Hamburg, where he lives for six years. And it's in Hamburg that he writes his great book, Tzitat Novel Tzvi, where he witnesses the Sabatian um, uh, um, um, upheavals. But then he goes back from Hamburg to Amsterdam, where he works in Amsterdam for a while, as a, uh, again, as a rabbi. But finally, he seems to get his job that he's been looking for a long time in 1678 when he moves to Livorno. But then, too, in Livorno, he has a fight. Um, and he goes back to Amsterdam. And then for the last 18 years of his life, he lives in Amsterdam. Um, eventually, he becomes the Rosh Yeshiva um, after Yitzhak Abba of the Fonseca steps down as the Rosh Yeshiva. And eventually, after Yitzhak Abba of the Fonseca dies, he becomes the chief rabbi of the Portuguese Jews for about four and a half years before his death in 1698. So he is... One of the points that um, is very important about him that Matt Goldish made in a really wonderful article about him is that Sasportas is the only rabbi to occupy a position in all four major centers of the Sephardic diaspora in Western Europe. 
Amsterdam, Hamburg, London, and Livorno. In all four of these cities, Hesportas ha- occupies a major position, and he also travels back and forth between North Africa and Europe. Something else, something that's interesting when you kind of alluded to this um, is that he's a little different, not not unique. Obviously, Mortera and uh, Pardo, I think, were also they were kind of from Italy or from part of was from Salonica, I don't remember, but, but he was, he was not a, a, from a conversal family. He was from a, a Sephardic family that always, you know, was, and never was no conversal. So he wasn't exactly similar in that regard to the, to most of the constituents, I guess, where he was, where he worked. Right. So this is a very important point that you pick up on Nahi. And this is an experiential difference as well as a um, intellectual difference. The, the community, or I don't like to use the word community because it, it gives us the sense of that it's voluntary and as if they're sort of Jews on the Upper West Side having a nice time. And that's not what this is. This is, this is there are no choices in the, seven, or there are not these kinds of choices in the 17th century. Um, uh, this Portuguese Jewish settlement is a new settlement in Amsterdam, and it's a settlement of um, of new Jews. Um, and the title of one of Professor Yosef Kaplan's wonderful books is um, from new Christians to new Jews. So you have a, a whole group of people who had experience as Catholics, um, who had lived lives as Catholics, either them or their parents or their grandparents. And then they they return to the Judaism of their, their ancestors, whether it's their grandparents, their great grandparents. Um, so they had experienced life as Christians. Um, and that being said, the rabbinic establishment um, is split. Some of them had experienced life as Christians or had been born into families that had experienced life as Christians, such as Menashe ben Israel, Yitzhak Abba the Fonseca, and others had been imported talent, right? This is a problem or not a problem. This is a phenomenon that we have throughout the early modern period. And then it continues in the modern period where you have um, rabbis who move around and are brought um, by usually by money or prestige or both or um, or some promise of, 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 of some combination thereof to a settlement of Jews. And many of the rabbis, not Abu Abdel Fonseca and not Menashe ben Israel, but people like you mentioned, Mortera and Pardo and Sasportas had lived their entire lives as Jews. What's interesting, which, or one of the things that separates someone like Sasportas from Mortera um, Yosef Kaplan proved many years ago, I believe in the 1970s, that Mortero was from an Ashkenazi family from, um, from Italy. Um, Sasportas was from a Sephardic family, from a, from a Sephardic family whose ancestors had included Nachmanides, the Ramban. So he was not wowed by the sort of stories of ancestries that the Portuguese Jews were telling about themselves um, in, in, in Amsterdam in the 17th century. And I think this led to a lot of conflict between him and his constituents. Right. And that's something I think that not only that, but I mean, kind of you, you pick up, I think, throughout the book is that, I mean, his overall personality, something that comes out through Titus Neville Tzvi and, and all different places and through the, the Chops Tzvi, that whole uh, discussion. So I guess, I mean, we can get discuss that a little bit as we discuss more Titus Neville Tzvi and the story. So obviously what he's, I guess, known for now, and you discuss a little bit in the book, was he known for then after the the the, the fact, but kind of he was known from the whole Chops Tzvi story. So I think I guess kind of quickly just to kind of relate that. So we, I, think, I think it's worth it's worth stepping back and thinking about what's going on in the 17th century. The Jews are in exile. Um, they there is a massive amount of violence in Europe around the Thirty Years' War. There is famine. Um, there is a huge amount of movement. Adam Teller has just written an extraordinary book about the refugee crisis um, of the 17th century, of which Jews were a really really, really crucial part. And so you have you have stories that are emerging and news reports and rumors that the Messiah has come. And this Messiah is not some random lunatic. He was a rabbi. He was a serious Talmud Chacham. We know from a really extraordinary article by Maoz Kahana and Sion that Shabtai Tzvi knew what he was doing. He was a serious Talmud Chacham. He was a rabbi. Um, and we have reports. You have reports that the entire rabbinic establishment in the Ottoman Empire believes that the Messiah has come and Jews are starting to dance in the street. So imagine if you walk into synagogue and you hear all of a sudden that reputable sources um, from families that you know of because they have branches in the cities that you live in are reporting that the Messiah has arrived. Most people would be pretty happy. And Sasportas' initial response to this 
is guarded optimism. He's willing to believe. Look, if the Messiah is willing to behave according to the way he is described by Maimonides at the end of his code of law, then great. I believe that Shabtai Tzvi, I can, I'm willing to believe that Shabtai Tzvi is the Messiah. This movement, though, doesn't take place in one day, and it doesn't take place in a week. It unfolds over about a period of around 15 to 16 months, depending on how long the mail takes to get to a particular place, a little bit over a year, let's say. And as the reports come in over the course of time period, you start to have, report, you start to have reports of increasing antinomian activity. And the antinomian activity collects around a whole number of things, the sort of uh, recitation of the divine name, the ritual slaughter of sacrifice. But I think one of the really crucial things, one of the really crucial litmus tests is eating on a fast day. Right. And this starts with the fast day of Asara Betevet, or as you would say, Asara Beteves, and it continues all the way, and in particular through Shiv Asar Betamuz and Tisha B'Av, right? This is my, you know, in Yana Dioma, as you as we would say, right? That you can't have it both ways. Either you fast because we are living in exile and because the we are mourning the destruction of temple, whoever this we is, right? I'm not sure. Or you don't fast because the Messiah has arrived. And once the sport that starts to hear that Shabtai Tzvi and his followers have, are, are not fasting, right? That Tisha B'Av becomes a holiday. Then he starts saying, no, you've crossed the line. You're not the Messiah. And then he goes on a campaign and he goes on the war path. And he has an, a really extraordinary courage in saying everyone else around him is saying yes. And he says no. And it's important to realize that it's not simply that the hoi polloi or the masses are saying yes. It is the elites who are saying yes. The elites believe that Shabtai Tzvi is the Messiah and Sasporta says no. And so what happens is he takes very careful notes and he records letters that he sends to other people and letters that he receives. And he edits them into a chronicle that he calls Tzitzat Novel Tzvi, but he doesn't print it in his lifetime. He puts it in the drawer. But what's important for us to realize is that we, that we would not have a narrative, we would not be able to write a narrative history, or at least the same way that, you know, Sholem was able to write a narrative history of Shabtai Tzvi, had we not had Sasportas' um, pretty much contemporaneous narrative in, Tzitzat, in this book called Tzitzat Novel Tzvi. Now, Something else I think we should, we should discuss a little is that you mentioned there is that he opposed he opposed you know the opposition and he was the lone kind of opposition. Now how did how how did he actually do that if during the movement? What was his opposition? Was he writing letters? Was he getting up in the local shul? What was he doing? So he writes. So it's important to realize that there are probably other people who have doubts about Shabtai Tzvi but aren't willing to be as local about it. Um, so he has rabbinic colleagues who are in Venice, like Shmuel Aboab. Um, who are probably quite skeptical about Shabtai Tzvi, but are not really willing to voice their skepticism. The way his opposition manifests itself is by letter writing. He writes to his colleagues and he criticizes them. And he writes really blistering prose. Um, you have to be a very learned man and you have to you know, know the Bible by heart and know rabbinic literature really well in order to understand his letters. And so he will write letters to people saying, you know, how dare you believe, um, you know, how, how dare you be so certain in your belief in Shabtai Tzvi? And then, you know, his colleagues will respond to him and say, no, 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 no you should be quiet yourself. You're, you know, why, why, you, why are you telling us that we, we shouldn't be so enthusiastic about Shabtai Tzvi? You know, people are actually repenting. The Beit Midrash is filled. This is a good thing. And you have to give his colleagues credit. They have a point. Right, people are starting to show up, show up to synagogue. People are starting to repent. People are starting to study Talmud or Gemara all day long. This is a good thing for a rabbi, right? But Sasporta says, "No, look, you don't understand. If they repent, but their repentance is based on a false idea of a Messiah who turns out not to be the Messiah, then their repentance, then they're jeopardizing the idea of repentance, of proper repentance." And he's saying doubt is a really crucial repository of the imagination. Doubt is a really, really crucial repository of actual genuine repentance. And this is something that annoys his colleagues. So he uses the mail and he gets up in synagogue. Those are the, those are the ways that, that he, that he um, expresses his dissent. 
and like you're saying, he was kind of there are there were others that had doubts, but he was the main vocal kind of dissenter here. I believe so. I mean, it, look, it could be that we'll find you know a manuscript of someone else, um, or a series, a cachet of letters of another rabbi, or another you know another. It doesn't necessarily not necessarily a Jew, someone else who um, really um, did not believe in Shabbat Zuh. But as in terms of the evidence at our disposal right now, um, the main sources, Sesportas is the primary doubter. Now, I will get into the content in a minute, but one other thing here regarding the letters is who was he mainly in contact with? And and was what because you said a lot of this was in the Sephardic diaspora, so to speak, where he was he in contact with anybody in Ashkenazi lands and mainly Ashkenazi communities? So he's mainly in contact with um, the, the Sephardic rabbinate in Amsterdam, um, some in Venice. Um, I believe he is in contact with some Ashkenazi rabbis. He's also in contact with some um, rabbis in Izmir. If I remember correctly, I don't have the book right at my disposal right now, but I think that he exchanges letters with a number of Ashkenazi rabbis um, in uh, over the course of the year and a half. Now, regarding the content, so he he goes and he opposes Shab Tzvi, obviously. So you mentioned this earlier. He talks about the Rambam, Maimonides, and his opinion of Mashiach. So interestingly, he doesn't say he doesn't believe in Mashiach, right? He obviously says he does, and he that's part of this here, but he kind of like clarifies that. So what is you want to talk a little bit about that? So this is very important, and this is a very important distinction. Sasportas is not willing to give up on the messianic idea. He's not willing to say, I don't believe in the Messiah. That is not what he is saying. He's saying, I believe in the Messiah, but Shabtai Tzvi is not the Messiah. It's a really, really crucial thing. And I think Sasportas, I'm not sure, um, because it's not clear to me that Sasportas had actually read the account of Nachmanides' um, account of his disputation in Barcelona. But there is a line in that disputation where Nachmanides says, look, the Messiah is not that crucial doctrine. It's not that big a deal, so to speak. I think Sasportas would have probably agreed with something along those lines. But for Sasportas, you have a messianic um, scenario that is described by Maimonides at the end of his code of law, right? The Messiah will be a political figure. He will wage wars. He will give signs and witnesses to his people. He will um, uh, bring the, 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 the exiles in. He will do a whole checklist of, of things, right? And this Messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, is not doing any of these things. So therefore, he's not the Messiah. Um, there's a script for Sasportas. Um, and the Sabatians, Shabtai Tzvi and Nathan of Gaza, are not sk- sticking to the script. And therefore, they're not the, they, he's not, Shabtai Tzvi is not the Messiah. Another interesting thing regarding the Rambam that you do you point out in your book is that, first of all, he doesn't draw a distinction between the Rambam as a halachist in, in, in the, in the halacha works and in Mer and in, in, in his philosophy works. And also... He didn't read Tversky. What did you say? He didn't read Tversky. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that he also was a Kabbalist. And you talk about he was a Makobal. He, there's, 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 intro, there's Sfarim, there was an introduction to Sefer, and he's called a Makobal. So he kind of like takes those two things kind of together. He didn't study at the Hebrew University either. Look, I think one of the things that's so complicated about Sasportas, and one of the reasons why he's such a difficult character, is that he he, he scrambles the, the categories that we, that we, and by we, I mean people living in the 20th or the 21st century, uh, tend to look at the early modern period with. So one, the first, the first is he um, is not willing to give up on either the guide of the perplexed or the the code of law. For my my monodies for him is both books, right? Both books are are really critical. He has both books on his bookshelf, um, and he's not willing to say, oh, my monodies is only a philosopher, you know, Allah Harry Wolfson, or my monodies is only a halachist, Allah Israel Tversky. No, he's both. That's one. The other is. He is a halachist. He's a posek. He's the most important posek in the Sephardic diaspora in the 17th century. Full stop. There's no question. Certainly in the Western Sephardic diaspora. Um, if you've spent any time with his response to Ohel Yaakov, you could tell that they're not a walk in the park. He's someone who really knew his stuff. He doesn't enter into the sort of bloodstream of halacha the way that someone like Yair Chaim Bakrak, his contemporary, the Chavot Yair does, or even someone like, you know, uh, a century later, like the Pnei Yoshua. His book doesn't have that kind of purchase or the Nudabi Yuda, right? But that doesn't mean it's not written at an extremely sophisticated level, level, and it also doesn't mean that he doesn't know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. It just didn't, it didn't enter into the sort of stream of halacha the way I, I'm not sure someone like Ovidah Yosef has. Um, but he's also a Kabbalist. 
right? In his, in his eulogy for, I think it's Mercado, he's referred to as Chachamu Mekubal, right? He is a Kabbalist. He, he does She'elat Chalom. He reads the Zohar. He quotes the Zohar. Um, and these are, the, the, he is not someone who thinks Kabbalah was a scandal, right? He, he thinks Kabbalah is the word of God. And this is really complicated because, you know, the, the, with the scholarship that I grew up on and that I still read and still really, and it's still very, very important, you know, Yaakov Katz's Halakha Kabbalah, Kabbalah, um, you, it, you know, it's bifurcated. Um, but I think for him, it's not. I think probably for him, um, it's much closer to Tashma's um, Haniglesh um, Banistar, where, you know, where, where he talks about the Shkiei Halakha, the sort of echoes of Halakha in the Zohar. Um, I think that that is sort of the world that um, Sasvortas is coming from. Now, something else is obviously a key figure in the Spathian movement was Nathan of Gaza being a prophet. And that's another thing where he doesn't say there's no prophecy anymore, right? It's something else that he's still receptive to, but it's not Nathan. So talk about that. So that's a really good point. So first of all, it's important to understand Nathan of Gaza is 23 years old or 22 years old when this whole thing starts. And Sasvortas is in his... 40s or 50s, right? If he's born in 1610 and starts in 1665, so he's roughly, or if he's born in 1614, so he's, you know, 51, 55, whatever else it is. Imagine a 55-year-old man sees a 23-year-old start a youth movement um, that, you know, has some messianic um, pretensions. He's not going to be so happy. So that there, I think there is an element of Sasportus' annoyance um, that a sort of young upstart but we know from all of the work done on Nathan of Gaza over the years, both by Tishbi, by some of Tishbi's students, Nathan of Gaza was not an idiot. He was a very learned man. Um, and Nathan of Gaza saw himself and was seen by others as a prophet. And I think you, you know, you see this correctly, that Sasportas is, again, not willing to give up on the idea of prophecy. He thinks that prophecy is a legitimate way of attaining knowledge in the middle of the 17th century. The way I have to say probably most European intellectuals thought that prophecy was a way of legitimate way of attaining knowledge in the 17th century. But he's not willing to he's not willing to concede that Sabatianism or Nathan of Gaza for that matter are legitimate prophets. Um, I think one last thing about the, the content you discuss this in the book also that he does kind of conflate does he draw a parallel between Sabatianism and Christianity is that right yes so I mean I think here in Sasportas has absolutely no patience with Christianity um and he basically says look this movement is doing the same thing to Judaism that the Jesus movement did in the uh he doesn't think about the first century as such but in sort of the the rabbinic period so to speak and Sasportas thinks that he, we are still, we, who we meaning people living in the 17th century, not people living in the 21st century talking over Zoom, we are still in the middle of the Jewish-Christian conflict. And the Sabatian idea puts Judaism at risk. And to concede, you know, that, you know, that the, 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 whole, the whole metaphor of the suffering servant or the whole passage of the suffering servant is really, really quite crucial for Sasportas. And he holds his ground and he says, look, this is like Christianity. And I think one this is in one respect, if there's one overlap between Modena and Sasportas, is I think that they both take Christianity very, very seriously. And they are not, they do not have this illusion that, you know, the Jewish Christian conflict is over and now we're all going to get along in some really wonderful kumbaya society. It's like, no, they take this very, very seriously. Sabatianism is a form of Christianity and Sasportas has no patience for this. Now, you mentioned this before, but it's just, you know, after after this is so let's once this is finished, kind of, so to speak, does he still he's not he doesn't publish the work and he just kind of goes along with things. He eventually becomes a rabbi in Amsterdam. And that's like it. Right. So the, this is a question. What are what are what are the conventions of the dissemination of knowledge in a particular time period? So Sportas was someone who had worked in the printing industry. He knew what it was to print a book. He had. Uh, aspirations and ambitions to publish his writing. Um, we know that he kept his responsa in a single particular manuscript, which now exists at Yeshiva University. You can go and see it if you want um, for Ohel Yaakov. So we know that he was highly attuned to the conventions of publication. He didn't publish Sitat Novel Tzvi as a printed book. The question is why? The answer is we don't know. Um, I think it has to do with a number of reasons. One is 
crude materialism. It was very expensive to publish a book as long as Cesar Novel Tzvi. And Sesportis had money at various points in his life, but it could be that he didn't want to um, part with the money at a particular time period to pay for it. So it could be, I don't know. Um, prop, as likely an, uh, uh, an answer having, or as likely a reason as the issue of cost has to do with the content of the, the, the book, which is that it doesn't exactly depict the Jewish elites in the most positive of lights. So they may, he may have done something what, of what Amnon Ralas Karkotskin talks about, inter, the internal censorship of not wanting to publish his writing um, because lest it, you know, lest it show his co-religionists in a very bad light, lest it show him in a light that he doesn't want to see. We don't know, we don't know why that we don't know why he doesn't publish it. A truncated version appears in print in 1737 after he dies. Uh, 39 years after he dies, as an appendix to his responsa. Every single copy of his responsa that I've ever seen, with one exception, has had this appendix ripped out. The one exception is in the Sholem Library. There is a photo offset reprint of Ohel Yaakov that was published in Brooklyn in the late 20th century that includes the entirety of the appendix. So now it's a very easy thing to find. You can find it on Hebrew books. You can download it at the click of a, uh, of a mouse. But in the early modern period itself, it was very difficult to find the Kitsura of Tzitzat Novel Tzvi. It's gone. It's cut out from almost every single copy to such a degree that Jacob Emden, who is someone who knew something about Hebrew printing and who was interested in amassing a pretty large collection of books had no idea about the existence of Kitsur Tzitzan of Tzvi until he was sent into exile himself from Altona Hamburg and ends up in, um, uh, in Amsterdam where he describes himself in the introduction to the book as Orech Natalalun. You see Emden is quoting Agnon and he says, I was here and I found um, you know, this copy of Kitsur Tzitzat Novel Tzvi, so I decided I'm going to re-edit it, and then he reissues um, it. And once Emden reissues it, the book is very easily accessible. Now, you mentioned Yubi Yaakov Emden, the Ivid, so you say he went and he published it. That was obviously dirt while he was embroiled in the controversy. With in the middle of the controversy, yes, absolutely. Right in the middle, when he, when he went to Amsterdam. So why did he decide to, to publish it, and did he view himself as similarly, the same name he talks about, and he kind of, did he view himself as similar? And you looking at writing a book now in the 21st century, I think you talk about this, they're not exactly the same. So it's very important to, um, to, to understand, um, Emden is a really complicated character. Um, and to the extent that um, I have any understanding of Emden, it has only to do with um, his edition of um, Sasportas's Kitsur Tzitzat Novel Tzvi, which he edits. He re-edits the book. It's not simply that he republishes it um, in a photo offset edition. He actually enters into the text and makes changes. Moreover, he also includes marginal annotations. He also takes some of the responses that Sasportas has in Ohel Yaakov and publishes them as an appendix to the book. He actually creates a genuine edition of the book. Um, and then is a very complicated figure. Um, he he edits Sasportas as part of his fight with Jonathan Ibishitz. His fight with Jonathan Ibishitz starts in 1751, and it's not clear that it ever really ends. Um, it, Ibishitz dies in, uh, about 15 years later in the middle of the 1760s. I think it's 1766, but Wikipedia will tell us the precise date of Ibishitz's death. And Emden dies in the 1770s, in 1778, I believe. And for the rest of, certainly most of Emden's life and all of Ibishitz's life, Emden is on a warpath. I'm not going to weigh in as to whether or not Ibishitz was a Sabatian or not. I don't think that's, I, I, that is an important question. But I think at, an equally as important question is, what does it mean to be a Sabatian in the middle of the 1750s? Because to be a Sabatian in the middle of the 1750s is not the same thing as to be a Sabatian in the middle of the 1660s. Most Jews in 1665 and 1666 were Sabatians. By 1751, it's a different animal already. It's a different thing. Emden discovers these amulets of Ibishitz, declares that they are Sabatian, and then goes on the warpath. And Emden really tries to rally the entire European rabbinate. Um, and Professor Lyman has written article after extraordinary article about um, this controversy. You can go and read them there. Where you should read um, each and every one of them. I will say this, that Emden is a heresy hunter. 
he goes after people. He examines them. He wants to make sure that, you know, he gets it right, so to speak. Sasportis is not a heresy hunter. Sasportis was a dissident. He was someone who was against the trend. He was not into, and one of the differences between Emden and Sasportas is after Shabtai Tzvi um, converts to Islam and the movement fizzles out, Sasportas stops writing about Sabatianism. But he doesn't suddenly become a nice man and, you know, he's not suddenly the old guy in the back of the synagogue, you know, who you know, gives out candy. No, he starts, he continues to fight. He's in the fight over, um, he's in the, you know, the, the rabbinic fray throughout the next 30 years of his life. He dies in 1698. He's still fighting into his 1690s. Because why? Because he, for Sasportas, Sasportas' fight is how to read Maimonides. It's not about Shabtai Tzvi. For Emdin, the fight was about Shabtai Tzvi. And that is a really, really crucial difference between the two of them. There are other differences, right? Emden has a relationship with his father that is extremely complicated, and he writes at great length about his father. We know nothing about Sasportis' father. Nothing. We don't know anything about him. Um, Emden had a relationship with printing that Sasportis didn't have. Um, there, are, there are some really, really crucial differences. I think there are certain, you know, real similarities that the two of them are these sort of vitriolic, very learned, um, really funny, you know, when read in a particular kind of way, learned rabbis. By the way, Wikipedia says Rabbi Yonasan died September 18, 1764. Whether that's correct. 1764. That's correct. Okay, thank you. I should know my facts before I go and agree to being on uh, Sfar and Chatter podcast. Thank you. So he dies in 1764. So the point is, for the last 13 years of Ibishitz's life, he's embroiled in this fight. And then for the next however many years, I think it's a decade and a half, that Emden is alive after Ibishitz dies. Emden's not done fighting just because Ibishitz is dead, right? Um, right, absolutely. So I think two other things that there's other parts in your book that you discuss. I, we don't have to discuss if you want to mention you, you discuss Sholem, obviously, and Sholem's interpretation of supports and, and, and that. And you also discuss somehow you 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 got to the uh, the Samarov or be able to title them also, right? So who do we want to talk about first? Sholem or or uh, uh, or title bomb? Let's talk about um uh let's talk about Sholem first. Um I Sholem was a German Jewish intellectual, moves to Palestine um and becomes a professor and writes this really great book in the late 50s in Hebrew, two volumes called Shabtai Tzvi, and then it's translated into English, um, and it appears in English in one volume in 1973 um, called Shabtai Tzvi, the Mystical Messiah. The What I try to trace in the book, um, because we have a lot of archival material about this, was how Sholem thought about Shabtai Tzvi through his reading of Sasportas, and that Sholem was deeply ambivalent about Shabtai Tzvi, and he was deeply ambivalent about Sasportas, and that he thought with, he thought against, he thought through um, Sasportas as he was trying to understand Shabtai Tzvi. Sholem was extremely attracted to the antinomian aspects of Shabtai Tzvi. In the very early essay, or relatively early essay, um, uh, that uh, Mitzvah HaBab Avera, Redemption Through Sin, he writes about the sort of the 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 aftermath of Shab, what happens after Shabtai Tzvi's conversion, and then in the next over the next course of the next twenty years, he continues to write about Shabtai Tzvi, and he gathers material for this sort of great big book. One of the things that he does, though, is he also um, changes the state of play in terms of the primary sources available. He sends Tishbi to edit Sasportas's chronicle. He um, has uh, the Yiddish Chronicle by Leib ben Oizer, Meister von Shabtai Svi, via Zalman Shazar. And then he also has Nathan of Gaza's writings. So Shogun really changed the map in terms of the primary sources that were available for him to write um, this account of Shabtai Svi. And Sasportas was a really crucial figure in this um, account. I think Sasportas was someone who Sholem had a profound problems with because Sholem had a real Maimonides problem. Um, and Sholem, and Sasportas was sort of the living testament of Maimonides within, the, within Sabathianism. Um, so that was what one of the things I tried to sort of trace and reconstruct um, as um, Sholem's relationship with Sasportas, Tishbi's relationship with Sholem, and then Tishbi's relationship with Sasportas. I should say that 
Tishby's edition of Sasportas, which takes a, for a very long time to appear in print and finally does in 1954 with Mossad Bialik, is a monument of, of textual scholarship. Um, it's really, it's, it is one of the greatest editions of any text I've ever read. Um, it's really genuinely mind blowing. Let's turn though to another um, Jew from uh, the Habsburg Empire, uh, Joel Teitelbaum. So Joel Teitelbaum was born in um, 1887, dies I think in 1979, Wikipedia can tell us, I think the dates are correct. And he's a Hasidic Rebbe, he's the Satmar Rav. And he is known already well before the before the Second World War as a firebrand, as a rabbinic firebrand. He's also known for his um, principled and um, deeply um, studied anti-Zionism. Um, in um, I believe it is in the late fifties, um, he writes a book called Vayoel Moshe, um, and he writes this book. I think it appears four times over the course of his lifetime. Um, he, he continues to add to it over the course of his life. And Vayol Moshe is an attack on Zionism from within the halachic tradition. And it's an argument that um, Zionism is a perversion of Judaism. And Teitelbaum reasons by analogy. And he basically makes an argument, look, the same way that Sasporta stood up and said to all the Sabatians, that um, they, uh, they, they are worshiping false gods. I say to you, all the Zionists, that you're worshiping false gods. And it, like Emden, he cast himself as a sort of Latter-day Sasportas. And that was one of the things that I tried to show was that, that here you have these two intellect, Jewish intellectual giants of the middle of the 20th century, Gershom Sholem and Joel Teitelbaum. And both of them are thinking through the problem of the Messiah through Sasportas and Sitzat Novel Tzvi at almost the same time, right? Um, I think Vayel Moshe appears in the late 1950s and Sholem Shabtai Tzvi appears for sure in the late 1950s. And they're both working through this issue. Um, I have heard, and I have no ev um, textual evidence for this, but given that um, this is a podcast and not a book, I feel comfortable saying this. I have heard that that Teitelbaum knew Tishbi when Tishbi was in um, in Hungary before the war and um, didn't didn't have such fond feelings towards him, which would make sense. Tishbi was a poet. Um, he was a Zionist. He left um, he left in I believe the thirties to go to um, to go to Palestine and to study at the university. Um, and Tishbi was a bachur yeshiva. He knew what he was doing. Um, um, so I, what was interesting to me was that here you had these two intellectual Zionists, Sholem and Teitelbaum, who are trying to think through the problem of Zionism um, via Sasporta. Right, interesting. So I just want to mention a little bit about the, the actual Tzitzis Neville Tzvi, because it is Farm Chatter podcast. We'll talk a little bit about the and everything, all Sasporta is seen through the book, really. Um, so like you mentioned, the, 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 the Chuvas, the Chuvot Olyakov was published one time, and then there was that photo offset. I don't think it's the, the, the copy. I don't think it's really around, but it's on Hebrew books. Anyone can download it. Um, Tzitzis Neville Tzvi, like you said, it was the Kitzer, which was kind of like truncated and kind of played around with, was in there. And then there's Yaakov Emden's, and then there's Tishbis, which has been out of print for like 60 years, and good luck getting a copy. Yeah. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason. I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows why it's still out of print. But you want to talk a little bit about Tishbis' edition, a little more about what he, he did there and how he kind of made into the complete edition. I'd be happy to talk about Tishbi's edition. Tishbi's edition is a monument of scholarship. And in order to understand what Tishbi was doing, we need to step back a second. There was a very, there was an entire transcription by Sasportas of Tzitzat Novel Tzvi that was in Vienna, that the librarian in Vienna, Arthur Zacharias Schwartz, was using to prepare an edition. There was another manuscript that was in Berlin that was Sasportas' notes for his for the letters that were going to appear in in um, um, Tzitzat Novel Tzvi, a sort of first draft. Schwartz was working in Vienna. He published a catalog of the Hebrew manuscripts. He published several catalogs of Hebrew manuscripts in Vienna. They are monuments of scholarship. They're used to this day. In one of the catalogs, he announces that he's preparing this edition. The Nazis um, take power in Vienna, and Schwartz flees, and he ends up in Palestine. And he dies in Palestine in 1939, right very shortly after his arrival. And his widow 
no knew of correspondence between Sholem and Schwartz, and turns to Sholem and says, look, Schwartz had this entire transcription of this manuscript by Sasportas. Can you do something with it? Can you actually publish it as a book? Sholem had an institute for the study of Kabbalah that was funded by Shokin. And one of the workers at this institute was Tishbi. Sholem assigned Tishbi to do this edition. And the, in the early stages of the project, Sholem was going to write the introduction to this, to this book. Tishbi took Schwartz's transcription of, of the Vienna manuscript and compared it to the photographs of the Berlin manuscript that had um, Sasportas' first drafts. And he produced an edition of the text that gives you the text of Sasportas and then the variants from the first edition um, in the margins. He also um, gives you, the, gives you um, uh, textual sources in footnotes to the book. The Berlin manuscript that had photographs that Tishbe, of which Tishbe had photographs of Sasportas' first draft was lost in the war and was thought to be gone. It showed up at auction in the 1980s at Sotheby's and Yeshiva University bought it for a song, I think, I don't know, $20,000, $15,000, $25,000, whatever it was, it was a song. The Vienna manuscript, to the best of my knowledge, has never resurfaced. Um, I don't, it did, but it, and, and is lost. But Schwarz's transcription was, was, was quite thorough and Tishbe had copies of Schwarz's transcription. So what Tishbe was doing in his edition was using Schwarz's materials, comparing them to the photographs of the Berlin manuscript and um, editing the text. And that's what he did. And he, he had originally hoped to publish the book with Shokin. Shokin promised him that he would publish it and reneged on the promise. And then Tishbe sent it to Mossad Bialik and Mossad Bialik accepted it and it appeared eventually in, the 19, in 1954. But it was ready for publication, I believe in 1946 or 1947. Yeah, I mean, he talks about it in the introduction, and uh, like I said, it's still not in print. So now it hasn't been it hasn't been published since then. It hasn't so. been published since then. Look, it is available in most good libraries. Most good Judaica libraries at a university um, will have it. Um, the National Library in Jerusalem has it. You can find it at most 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 good libraries. So it's not. I mean, if you want to find the text, it's not impossible to find the way it was in the 17th century or the 18th century. But yes, it should be. It's a book that should be republished. Um, I don't think we need a new edition of it. We, need, we just simply need to republish it. Right, exactly. They just need to reissue. And, and one last thing you, you mentioned with Sasporta. So that was the whole controversy. The manuscript, someone was have, someone held them and they, then he sold them. I think there, there is the old Yaakov um, manuscript there also? Is there other manuscripts from him now that are at Yeshiva University? So the, the, Yeshiva University owns two manuscripts of Sasportas. One is the, first, is the, is the printer's edition of Ohel Yaakov. It, it's Sasportas' text that the printers used to print Ohel Yaakov. And there are a couple of things in that manuscript that didn't end up appearing in the text, but by and large, it's, a, it's, it's, it's pretty similar to the printed text. Then there are the, the notes for the first draft of Tizano Wiltzi. Are there other manuscripts of Sasportas? There's a manuscript of Sasportas' son in Amsterdam, which we know about. Um, I don't know of other ones to the best of my knowledge, but I could be wrong. Right, I think one, of, one the of the things that I found um, and, and in the years of working on him is that we have a fair number of notarial documents and we have a fair number of documents in the archival holdings of the, of the Jewish settlements in which he lived, where Sasportas' signature appears. I mean, his signature appears on countless number of Kitubot and Livorno. It appears all over in Amsterdam. He appears in a whole number of notarial documents. I mean. Unlike, I mean, look, if you want to go and, you know, um, it's a sport, this is a rabbi with whom, if you want to actually go and find where he was at particular time periods, there are, there, there are, there is material. I mean, there is material that, you know, you can go and find. Speaking of his son, I think that the third volume of the Kitvei Yitzchak Avov Daf Anseka just was published by Mchon Yerushalayim. The Chachme Recipe of Amsterdam, they called it. It's not really him. It's a lot of, and there is a uh, a Hespid there that his son gave for him that was just published for manuscript yes. that just yes. came out a few months ago. Yeah. So I'll mention that. Okay, so uh, is, is now I would ask you the final question. Are there any future projects that you're working on? Are you still staying in the 17th century? I hope to do an edition of Arino Hem with uh, the text by Modena, where there is a um, there is a need for um, um, a new edition of the text um, because we have a, a lot more manuscripts than were available um, to um, Nehemiah Leibovitz. 
And as for that, I mean, um, as for other projects, I mean, once I do the addition of Modena, we'll see. But that, that might take me the better part of the next 10 years. So we'll see. Is that planning to be in Hebrew or in English? Um, I hope to do a, a, an addition of the Hebrew text with an English translation. But um, I have to find a publisher first. Sounds good. Okay, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you it. for having me.